you can find your seat, we're going to continue on. Make a friend, get their, get their digits. What do you do? I don't even know. McCartney, now when people want to like get information, you give your handle or you do give your phone number still? Do you give them like your Snapchat? <laughs> she doesn't know. Thank you, like give, give somebody your Snapchat name. I don't know anything about this stuff anymore. All right, all right. Welcome again. We are going to finish up a conversation we've been having called God at Work. We highly value the work that you all are doing. We see the work that you do in your everyday life as an extension of the mission of this church, as an extension of the mission of God. You're joining in God, God's work in your vocation. And we look at vocation relatively broadly as well. Many people get paid for certain work that they do. Others don't, they're volunteers. Other people looking for work is part of your vocation. Um, if you're unemployed or underemployed, so we notice that too. Many people caring for others, little kids or older folks, is a big part of your vocation and your work. And then for a lot of us, it's learning. There's many people who are students. This is all our vocation. This is all the work that God's given us to do. And we so deeply believe that you're joining in God's work in the world when you do that work. And so we've had a number of conversations. We talked about how we are image bearers of God when we do the work that God's created us for because God is a God of who works and started by creating this world. We talked about that if you want to look back on our sermons. We had a panel of people talking about how they've been spiritually formed by their work, the environments that they work in and the work that they actually do. Sometimes formed in good ways, sometimes in not so good ways, and they were really vulnerable. And then last week, Pastor Mike talked about just what it looks like to be people who step into our workplaces having uh, Jesus values, having kingdom values, being people who uh, think about ethics maybe differently and might be willing to say or live out, because of my Christian faith, here's what's important to me. And we talked about that last week too, so I'd love for you guys to check that out. And so today I'm going to finish that conversation. So I hope that uh, there's one more of these sermons in you, and then guys, next week is Advent. Mixed reactions because of things, lists and things to do, I know. Okay, so let's pray and then we'll jump in. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we welcome you to this place. As Asha said earlier, you are with us. As we look forward to Advent, where we celebrate that you are Emmanuel, the with us God. You are here with us now. You are with us as we go from this place. You're with us in the places in which we work and learn and play and live. God, we thank you for being that kind of God. We thank you for this opportunity we have to worship here at Sheridan. God, we pray that you would bless them in the name of Jesus for their hospitality towards us. God, as these kids look forward to finishing up this semester and going into a, a break, God, I pray for perseverance for those teachers, faculty, staff, parents, and kids. God, would you be present in this place? And God, would you speak to each of us this morning as we open up your word together? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, this, so my second office is Mojo Coffee. Anyone have a second office that is a coffee shop? I know some of you do. Okay. So Mojo Coffee is my second office. And anyone who knows me well or anyone who spends time at Mojo knows that because they see me there all the time. And so I've made some really good friends at Mojo Coffee. And one of them is this guy named Robin. And Robin is a contractor. He comes into people's homes and does middle to large projects to fix people's houses, to um, finish people's basements, that kind of stuff put decks off the back of their house. This is what Robin does. And so every time I see him, I'm like, what kind of project are you doing today, Robin? And he tells me. And uh, the other day, uh, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, he said to me, Steph, what's the best part about being a pastor? What's the best part about your job? And I said, because I was feeling a little sassy that day, I said, you know what, Robin? The best part of my job is the same as the worst part of my job. It's people. All right? Now, I knew it's a little risky to share that all with you, but I'm just being honest, that's what happened. Now, I don't think I'm alone, though. <laughs> I think most of us would say, many of us would say at least, that some of the best things about our job and the worst things about our job are the interactions we have with other human beings. Because we are messy and broken human beings, and so are all the other ones that we encounter. And so I think that it's this interesting dynamic where it can be really wonderful, but it can also be super difficult. And I think it's a really important thing that we think about this because uh, the, the challenges that come with working with people have some pretty big barriers. One of them just being that nearly every type of work involves working with other people. And oftentimes, 
you as the person don't get to decide what kind of people or who these people are, um, whether they're customers or coworkers. For most of us, it's not our decision, okay? So that's a barrier. Uh, and then the second barrier is just how significant it affects our well-being and our job satisfaction. Nearly every job satisfaction survey, if you look at it, there's a bunch of them. They always do them in different spaces and different companies do them. But in the top five, almost every time, the job satisfaction uh, is determined by people's coworkers and their experience with their coworkers. It's almost always in the top five as you look through all of them. And as Jesus followers, as people who want to be like Jesus, live like Jesus, and follow the actual being of Jesus in our life, I think we need to figure out in our own ways and in our own personalities, which are all very different, what it looks like to be people who overcome some of the obstacles that are often in the way, the challenges that we face when it comes to working with other people. And I think the reason we need to do that is because it's pretty clear that God calls us and invites us to love our coworkers in the name of Jesus. My, my main point today is that God loves our coworkers through us. God loves our coworkers through us. This is an invitation that I think we all have, and I think it's critical to God's mission in the world because so many of us spend 50% of our waking hours of our entire life at work. And so the opportunity that we have to love people with God's love is going to happen at work because we spend so much time there. So I saw this image recently, this guy named Rich Wild. I don't know, it's called Six Marks of Mission. I'm going to tell you what it says if you can't see it. So it's a pie graph, and then you see at the top, it's in red, uh, marks of mission, sharing the gospel, discipling other people, caring for those in need, that's the yellow one, green, challenging injustice and pursuing peace, light blue, protecting and sustaining creation, and then the sixth, sixth mark of mission that is a big chunk is purple, anxiety about talking to other people. Okay, so I just think this is hilarious. When I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, this feels so real. Because we want to be people who share the good news of Jesus. We want to disciple other people and be discipled. We want to be people who care about justice and mercy and mission and all these things. And most of those things involve other people, yet a huge part of the pie feels at least to like a lot of us that we have anxiety about just talking to other people. So some of you, you looked at that and you totally resonated with that. And then there's some of you who are like, I don't totally get it. Because you might be those people that are like, you know, I just love talking to people of all types. Everyone's just a friend I haven't met yet, and I just love getting to know people. I'm never anxious. Why are you anxious? It's not hard. Invite them over for dinner. Do you want to come over for dinner? My house is open all the time. Open door policy. Join me. Come by. Stop by. You are the weird ones. Okay? That's, that's great, and we totally celebrate that about you, but you are the, the, the small slice of the pie, and we are so grateful. But even extroverted people, I'm extroverted, I love being around people, but I have some anxiety about being around people I'm not close to, and people that I don't really know, or I'm not totally know what to expect. And that is the, the description of many of our coworkers, people we don't know very well, we don't totally know what to expect, we might encounter a lot of strangers in our work, it's different for everybody, but I think this is really real. So. Even for those of us who are extroverted, and then certainly for introverted people, I get this. I get that this is hard. But just because it's challenging doesn't take away the very clear invitation that we have to be people who are conduits of God's love. It doesn't mean we have to do that with everyone. Even some of you who are like, everyone's a friend I just haven't met yet. That's going to be not as deep. I'll just suggest that. But there's an opportunity for all of us. So today I want to dig into this passage. Uh, and actually, it's the, the passage that Michael talked about last week. If you were here, you can look back at it. It's in 1 Peter 2. If you have a Bible, you can pull it out. And today I want to talk about this opportunity, this, this invitation, perhaps in a way that you have not heard before. I'm trying to build some suspense here. And I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable. However, it is, it's a different way of looking at it. And so um, that's me setting up the suspense so that you listen as we read 1 Peter so I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in on, on four verses out of the passage of 1 Peter 2 that uh, Michael read last week. Now, quick overview. Peter is an early leader in the church. He's writing this letter to a group of people who are experiencing violent persecution for being Jesus followers. That's the reality. So those of us who feel some tension, I know a lot of people have mentioned there's a lot of tension around even just being honest that you're a Jesus follower or a Christian at work. I think that that's real, and I, I empathize with that, and we need to talk about it. But the people that Peter was writing to were experiencing something that pales in comparison to what we experience when we feel that tension. This was so much more than that. And, and he is writing to these people, and he's trying to encourage them. And he's, I think, as you're listening, just imagine people who are in a struggle. 
people who are feeling a pretty real struggle. And what I want you to listen for in these four verses, uh, I'm going to read uh, 4 and 5 and 9 and 10. Listen for the role that Peter gives the people who are listening. He tells them you have a specific role, and it's mentioned twice, all right? So let's read this together. We'll have it up on the screen. 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 4. As you come to him, as you come to God, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, talking about Jesus, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Skipping down to verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There's a lot of descriptions there, but there's two roles, one role that's mentioned twice. In both in verse 4 and then in verse 9. And it is holy priesthood and then royal priesthood. You are a holy priesthood. You are a royal priesthood, Peter is saying. So when you hear the word priest or priesthood, depending on who you are and your, your background, you probably imagine a number of different things, whether that title priest was used in the type of clergy you might have experienced in your life. But the most important question when we're reading the Bible is not what does that word mean to us, but what did that word mean to the people who were originally hearing the letter? So they were hearing it read to them. And so the question that we need to ask is, what would the original audience have thought when they heard the word priest or the word priesthood? So when we think about the hearers of this letter, we know that it was a pretty diverse group of people. In fact, in the beginning of 1 Peter, it says that this letter was destined to go out to five different provinces. And so very different groups of people were going to receive this letter eventually. That's kind of how messages were transferred at that time. And it says that Peter's audience... Uh, was, were people that were living in different places, but what we are pretty sure is that the audience was also people who were ethnically Jewish, and then people who were at the time called Gentile, or people who were not Jewish. At this point in the story of God, both people, both types of people would have been worshiping together and coming together as the church, as they were beginning to be called. And so Peter is writing to people who have a diverse background. However, nearly all of the hearers of this letter, and I say hearers because most people were listening to it read in the oral tradition, they would have heard this word priests, and right away they would have thought about leaders in the temple in Jerusalem. The religious leaders in the temple in Jerusalem that would come from the tribe of Levi, out of the 12 tribes of Israel, the Levites were the uh, priestly tribe, the priestly tribe. This would have been in their mind right away, boom. So if you were like, oh, that makes me think of the tribe of Levi, then you would be like a first century person in the ancient Near East. But that's not what most of us hear when we hear that. So then the question is, what would they think about those people? Well, they would think, man, these priests are the most important people in a lot of ways in society. They are given the most special privileges. They are given special duties and opportunities. And most importantly, these people were invited to be in the most direct and close contact and relationship with God. These people were given special access to God that other people didn't have. That was the perspective of the time. In fact, they were people who were seen as being able to intercede or go to God on behalf of those poor, regular, normal people because you weren't a special person. And so the special people got to go talk to God. So if you want to say something to God, you can let us know and we'll go do that. Of course, they were also doing other things. They were communicating um, to God, but they were also sacrificing animals and resources to ask for forgiveness for the people. These were the roles that they had. So listen again to verse 4, and imagine you're somebody in this time, and you understand priests this way, and you hear in verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone. Not as the priests come to him, as you come to him, the living stone, Jesus, rejected by humans. You are like living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. You. And it is critical for us to realize that that would have been an extremely meaningful thing for Peter to say to these struggling people. This would have been one of the most encouraging things that he could say. He's saying, listen, God has given you an incredible gift. You are now all considered priests. You are now people who have the same access to God and the same privileges. This would have been seen as a huge gift. It's like you're getting like, like, uh, like a VIP backstage pass to your favorite artist, except it's a bigger deal because it's God. It's not a great illustration, but you know what I'm saying. Like you're getting this great opportunity. And Jesus is the one that's made this possible. 
And they would have been coming to some understanding of this, that the temple was where everyone previously had gone to get close to the presence of God. But now Jesus was representing through his teaching and through his life and death and resurrection that God had left the building. It's funny because it was Elvis has left the building and the VIP pass. That doesn't matter. Okay, so... The temple is where people had thought they needed to go, but now every Jesus follower has the same access to God. There was now no need for this elite priesthood. And it's it's hard because here we are 2,000 years later and we sometimes still feel as though there's people who have a direct line to God and then people who don't. And I just want to suggest that that's not real. Every once in a while someone calls me and is like, I need you to pray because I think you have a direct line to God. And I'm like, I really don't any more than you do. Like that, that's not real. Like any person has a direct line to God to communicate. In fact, one person the other day called and said, I got a prayer request, please pray. And then called back five minutes later and said, the prayer was answered, it was awesome, thanks for praying. I never prayed. Like I actually didn't get to it. Like I hadn't got to it yet, like I was going to pray a little later. Anyway, we all have a direct access to God. There isn't a need for this. I didn't tell her that, so I'll have to go back and tell her. (laughs) I'm like, I'm so glad. (laughs) She's like, thanks for your... I said, you can pray, you can talk to God at any time. You guys need to understand that that's not something that would have been assumed by people before Jesus did what he did. You had to be a part of this elite group of people. It's a little bit weird that Peter mixes metaphors here. Do you notice how he mixes metaphors? He says, you are living stones, a holy priesthood. It's a little bit weird to talk about a stone and then like an important role like a priesthood. But I think what Peter's trying to do here is really break people out of this a kind of like, like historical understanding that God has to be contained by a tabernacle or a temple. He's trying to say God does not need to be contained in a building. God is now going to be present with anyone who gives their life to Jesus. God's presence is with you. You are like the stones, but you don't stay put in a building. You can move around because you're a living stone. It's like a temple made of priests like human beings. So I actually found this picture I thought was kind of funny and it, it's kind of small. The, the, the images are small, but it's a bunch of little people coming together to make a house and you can see the people are walking out and coming in. And this is this weird image that Peter's giving to try to break up the construct that people had that you had to go to a physical building to be able to be with God. He's saying you're a spiritual house, a house that is led by the Holy Spirit. You are gathered as a spiritual house and you are scattered as a spiritual house. You are gathered as a community of priests and you are scattered as priests with an important role. And as you keep on coming to God, I love that. It says, as you come to God, just so you know, when you read that in the original language, it's a process. As you continue to try to come to God, man, some days that's harder than others. Some seasons that's harder than others. But the process is right there in verse 4, as you come to God, as you come to him, the living stone, as you're constantly trying to come to God, God makes you into a living stone a priest with an important role who is gathered and then scattered into the world that God loves. So this is us. We are priests. You are priests. I don't know if anyone's told you that before, but wherever you go, you are a priest. And not of a building, not of necessarily like a, a, a specific building like they would have thought of, right, of a temple or of a church, but you are a priest of the places and the spaces that God calls you to. This is said twice here and it's affirmed in other ways in scripture. So I I want you to sit with this, and I know it might feel strange to some of you, but sit with this idea. We'll put it on the screen. You are the or a priest of your workplace. You are a priest of your workplace. And if that's a new thought for you, you're probably like, okay, cool. What does that mean? Okay, what do you mean by that? So let's talk about it. Happy to do that. So remember Robin, who I was speaking to um, at the coffee shop? Robin is a Jesus follower too, and we've talked about our mutual faith in Jesus, and he was asking me about what the best part of being a pastor is, and I was being sassy. Um, But then I did continue on and not continue to be sassy. So I said the best and worst part is people, and he said, oh, that's the same for my job as a contractor. The best and worst part is people. Har, har, har. And then I said, look, honestly, the most amazing part of my job is that I get to be with people in the most incredible and the most devastating moments of their life. I get to be present with people in their joys and their sorrows. I get to be there when people are, are so excited and when they're so distraught. And there's something, even about the most painful aspects of life and the most difficult aspects of life, there's something so holy and sacred about being with people in those times. And Robin said, I totally get that. That's just like my job as a contractor. Okay. He said, 
when I'm working with people, I'm almost always in their house. And they're not moving out. They're there too. Because, like, I see people in some of their best and worst versions of themselves because they're in their house and their guard is down. He's like, you would be surprised about how many conversations I've had with people where I'm the first person that they told that they got a cancer diagnosis. Or I'm the first person that, that witnessed them get into a really heated argument with their spouse or their teenager. He's like, I see some of the worst things, but I also see some of the best things. And I get to see people so excited when their physical space is more conducive for their family. He's like, I see the best and the worst. He's like, let me tell you a story. He's like, this doesn't always happen to me, but the other day I came into the workplace and I was about to start fixing this person's bathroom and I just hear her weeping in the other room and I go in and, and someone's in there and they, they had just gotten some really bad news and, sh and she said, what do I do? And I didn't know what to do, Robin said. So I just said, well, if it were me, I would just pray because I, I believe that God can make a difference in the situation and I, I believe that in Jesus' name that God's presence can be with you. And the woman said, I don't know how to pray. Will you teach me? And Robin said, yep, all right. <laughs> so, he, so he taught these people how to pray. This is the story. And he says, no, I don't, that doesn't happen very often. But he is embracing his identity as a priest. He's stepping into this space with an important job to do. And I absolutely believe that the work that he does to restore houses is super important. I think it absolutely reflects God's image of how he's taking something and making it better and doing something awesome to make it more conducive for people. His, his actual job is honoring to God. But as he's in his workplace, the fact that he takes on the identity of priest is a posture that can be life-changing for him and for the people that he's encountering. He says, sometimes I just pray for them without them knowing, and I hear what happens, and, so, and oftentimes I don't even know. But when I go into this place, I assume that God might be doing something there, and I might get to be a part of it. And I was like, Robin, can I share that on Sunday? Because that's amazing. And he's like, sure. But this is what a priest does. A priest comes into a space and assumes that God is doing something there, and that there's other people who might want to connect with God, and priests help people connect to God. That's what priests do. There's a scholar named Tori Sealand who used this term, because of course there's like, I keep saying like the priests in the temple are like the elite priests. She used the term, the priesthood of the faithful. The priesthood of the faithful, and I love that. When I heard her, when I was reading that and I heard this phrase, the priesthood of the faithful, I just thought about all of you. I thought about that statement and I thought, you are people who want to be faithful to God. You are people who I know your stories, I see your lives. You want so badly to be faithful to the people that God's put in your life. That's who you already are. That's who you already want to be. And I'm so excited and proud of that. There's these three aspects as I was doing a lot of reading about this concept. Because it's, it's out there a lot. You might have heard the phrase, the priesthood of all believers. So you can read a lot about it. But there were three themes that came up that I just want to share with you. The first was how people embrace a priestly identity. How do the people, the, pri the priesthood of the faithful, how do they embrace a priestly identity? Not just something that they are when they're at church or at Bible studies or something, but that this is who they are wherever they go. The second part was living out the priestly functions. So a priest has functions of their role that they step into. And then finally, over and over again, there's this conversation about reflecting God's character together as a community of priests. So the priesthood is not isolated. They might be scattered and gathered, but they're never alone because God's spirit is with them and they represent a larger community of priests. So let's just walk, walk through them really quick. So embracing a priestly identity. It says here right in the beginning of this passage, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, an, a holy nation. Did you hear that? This is all identity language. And I know that Peter is using kind of ethnic identity words. In fact, he uses the word ethos that has to do with ethnic. And he's not saying reject your ethnic identity. He's saying in addition to, in fact, just as important as your ethnic identity is to you, so is your identity as a Jesus follower, as a priest who is sent out. This is so important, but so is this opportunity, this identity to say this is who I am. And so embracing a priestly identity might look like some of these things. First, belonging to God's kingdom. Not to the little kingdoms, but to God's kingdom. You see here it says, God says, you are my special possession. Some of you might feel a little weird about that idea, but man, belonging is so crucial. Every one of us desires to be people who belong. And we don't always feel belonging with other people, even sometimes with other Jesus followers, but you belong to God. When you feel the most alone, you belong to God. And this is part of that identity is to say to God, I belong to you and your kingdom. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. 
And the other little kingdoms of the world, I participate in those. And they're not all bad. There's good things about them. But first and foremost, my allegiance is to the kingdom of God and what God cares about, like we talked about last week. The second thing I think we see about the priestly identity and embracing it is to draw near to God. I don't know about you, but if you have tried to love other people with your own human love, it doesn't go as far. I just can't, it just doesn't happen for me. I run out of my own human love. Drawing near to God to receive God's love is the only way that we can really be people that God loves others through. To draw near to God. As you're coming to God as, and, and relying on Jesus as the cornerstone, as Mike talked about, of this spiritual house. Jesus is the cornerstone. What does the cornerstone do? It holds the foundation firm. It gives us something to build off of. The third thing. I think in embracing a priestly identity is being holy, being set apart. You heard that word holy. It means set apart. Some of what we talked about last week around ethics is probably a part of that set apartness. But you know the thing that I think about when I think about set apart? I think about people who are steady because they actually rely on Jesus as their cornerstone. People who are people who have peace surrounding them. Would that not be something that is set apart? in our workplaces, people who are actually coming into a place without an overwhelming sense of anxiety because they know that they rest on the cornerstone of Jesus in their life. I know that's not how all of us feel, but man, would that be countercultural? And then finally, receiving their royal authority. To embrace your priestly identity, you have to receive your royal authority. Now, this is super important. When you hear the word, you may think of a role that is powerful and above other people, but this is not what Peter's talking about. Peter is talking about people who come up under others and take responsibility for the care of people that it's not technically on their job description to care for those people. No one told them that they had to come up under and support those people around them, but they take on the responsibility as, as though someone who was of, of royalty and saying, this is my kingdom that I'm joining into and I care about every person who's a part of this kingdom. And I wanna be a part of coming up under and serving. You've heard me talk about this, if you've been around Mill City, about this idea of the sacred space and the secular space. And I just think this is a false dichotomy. Every space can be sacred because God can be present anywhere. And the idea that we go stepping out of the realm of who God is into another space, there is a word for that. It's not secular, it's desecrated or desacred. Places that are void of God are desacred, and we know the kind of brokenness and darkness that happens in desecrated space. And we, as people who embrace our priestly identity, can come into desecrated space and say, we are going to re-consecrate this place. We have an opportunity to say, this does not have to stay a place void of God's loving presence because now we're here and we're saying, God wants to be with you. This space can be sacred again. This can be holy ground again. This cubicle can be holy ground. This commute can be holy ground. This space on the internet can be holy ground that I'm connecting with people. We get authority to do this. It's difficult to believe that that's true, but we have that authority because of Jesus and praying in that authority in Jesus' name. Okay, so then what are the priestly functions? I'll, I'll kind of go through them quickly because they're not complicated, but right there in verse 5, the function, offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. The temple priests, the elite priests, they offered vertical sacrifices to God. And every scholar who studies 1 Peter says what's so clear here, based on the teachings of Jesus, acceptable to Jesus, is that there are sacrifices that are offered to God vertically, but also horizontally towards other people. Loving God and loving neighbor. This is so crucial to what it looks like to offer spiritual sacrifices. They're not physical sacrifices anymore, but spiritual sacrifices to God. I think it looks like loving and blessing other people. How many people need love? How many people need to feel like they're blessed? And someone's saying, I want to just bless you in the things that you're doing. I think people want to experience that. Maybe even if we don't use that word, but we're encouraging them. Serving and caring for others. Once again, it's not about power. It's about serving and coming up under those and saying, I care about you even though it's not required of me. Connecting people with God. Connecting people who are saying, I'm looking for something bigger than myself. You guys, I see this happen all the time. I understand that if somebody's not looking for God in their life, it might be a tough conversation. But how about those people who are encountering something in their life, they're actually curious about something bigger than themselves. Would they even know we're people they can have that conversation with? Would they even know that we're people who tried to connect with God and would be willing to say like Robin, well, I think I can teach you to pray. Ah, like I'm trying. Would they know that about us? 
I see it happen all the time. I've experienced it myself, and I've heard the stories that people will reach out if they know you're someone they can trust. And then I think finally, if we're going to be people who take these priestly functions, it's sharing the story of God's mercy. In verse 10, declare the praises of the one who called you, a God who brings mercy, a God who brings us out of darkness and into light. This right here in the way that it's talking about the word declare, declare to God praises, declare to other Jesus followers praises. But what we know is that this way it's being spoken of here in 1 Peter is outward, declare the praises of God to other people and give God the credit. And I think that moves finally to this idea of what it would look like to reflect God's character as a community of priests. This is kind of about the, the reputation of Jesus followers. And here I think we see some aspects of this. First, that, that people who are Jesus followers are faithful people that other people can count on. I hate to say it, but I think that's a little bit countercultural. That you are faithful people that other people could count on to be there for them. I'm not sure that's how it often feels. And there's people who are able to do this who aren't Jesus followers, but are Jesus followers known for this? People who praise God and give God credit. People who praise God and give God credit, as it's talking about praising God here. What's the difference between giving God credit? It's usually giving ourselves credit. Once again, countercultural. To say, God, you have given me everything that I have, and I'm giving it back to you, my skills, my talents, my resources, and I give you some of that credit for that doesn't mean you don't say thank you when someone gives you a compliment, but what does it look like to be people who will say, I'm going to love my community in the name of Jesus, actually giving God the credit, and then finally being people of light when darkness surrounds, being people of light when darkness surrounds. Do you notice that none of this is about being perfect? None of this that I've talked about is about being people who make sure other people go to church, although some people really don't think they're invited, I found out, but... That's not what this is. The priesthood of all believers is not, how can I go and be a priest and then say, actually, could you come to my professional Christian? They might talk to you. That's, that's just not what we see here. What we see are people who are not leading the church or doing any sort of priestly functions in some sort of formal way in a building anymore, right? The God has left the building. We're now going to be the church where we are and love people in these ways. Not perfect people, but people of light in the midst of the darkness that we have in our own life. Not perfect, but people who are willing to say, there's brokenness in my life and I'm willing to bring it into the light. This is countercultural, and I don't, I don't know that this is the reputation of Jesus' followers in most spaces. But here's what I do know. If we are people who begin to take on more and more, some of you have, but take on more and more this identity, this priestly identity of the priesthood of the faithful, if we take that identity on, if we live out the functions of the priesthood of the faithful, then I really do think that we can be people who reflect God's character as the community of priests, as the community of the faithful. And I wonder if there's at least some people in our lives who would see some of these things in our lives, especially when they're in need of love or service or blessing, that they might say, I just have an inkling that this person might be someone I can talk to about that. Now more than ever in the workplace, I know you've heard this, people are bringing their whole self to work. I love this. I think it's so healthy for people not to bifurcate their life. But that means that people are going to bring their joy and their pain and their celebration and their suffering. And these types of experiences open people up towards something bigger than themselves. That's just what happens. Will you be people who said, in this space, my posture is that I'm open to those moments for people? The need for someone to enter into those spaces of celebration and suffering is often so real for people. So if we accept our priestly identity, if we live out the priestly functions, then I think we can have this reputation as a community. And I think it's that that's going to help us to love other people and love our coworkers through, in the name of Jesus. That God would love our coworkers through us. At the very end of our time, we're going to go into our time of worship and communion. Um, I just want to do a brief time of commissioning. So I'm just preparing you that we're going to do a commissioning. You don't have to do anything. But I just want to send you out into the workplaces that you're in. And so maybe during this, this time of offering and, or time of, com of communion and a time of worship, there's just two questions I want you to reflect on before we have that commissioning. And the first one would be, have you accepted this role of priest in your work and vocation? I don't, I don't advocate going in and announcing that you're now the priest of your workplace. That's just not at all what I'm saying. But have you internally taken on this posture of one who can be a connector to God? And then maybe just what would be the next step for you in this process as you're trying to draw closer to God.
And then we'll have this time of commissioning after our communion and two songs of worship.